The following interview was conducted with Jim L. Window, Professor of Organizational Leadership and Supervision for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, February the 9th, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank Good you. Good afternoon Catherine. to you. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and parents and siblings in early years. Well, Catherine, uh, I was born in, in on the east side of Indianapolis, out in the country at that time. It's not country now, it's city. But it was a rural area, and um, it was a, it was very difficult times then. Uh, it was right after the depression, and um, my parents uh, had uh, lost their home in the depression. My father had lost his work, and uh, so they had to move out of their house. And my dad had our belongings stored, and uh, there was uh, eight children at the time in the family. So we wow. were a large large family. And my dad still didn't find work, and so couldn't pay the storage bills. So the county sheriff auctioned off all of our belongings. And so that's all we had was what we had on. And so it was a tough time. It was, it was a very tough time after the Depression. Uh, my father, we had, we had a small farm. Um, and my father eventually did find work, but uh, we raised uh, our garden and had cows and pigs and chickens and that sort of thing and sure. sustained ourselves. Right. And so with that many children, we all worked and um, put ourselves through school. And, um, Did you go to grade school near? Tell us about grade school. Really, uh, yeah. Grade school, uh, yes. Went to a small, went to a grade school with, with six grades um, in a small area called Cumberland, Indiana, which was east of Indianapolis. And it was a good school. It was a, a loving teachers. And, but everybody, back then, everybody was having hard times. And, yeah. uh, so as a kid, you really didn't know that it was tough. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we didn't have kindergarten back then in that era. And uh, so there wasn't any preschool preparation. And uh, so frankly, I didn't do very well. <laughs> and, and to be honest with you, I failed the first grade of school. So I got off to a pretty rough start. <laughs> but then we moved forward. And then we moved forward, right. yes, from okay. there. Well, yeah. Where did you go to high school? Tell us about high school. I went, went to high school at Warren Central High School in Indianapolis, mm -hmm. um, east of Indianapolis. And uh, it, was a, it was a small school, too, in, in, the fa in that it was not uh, in the city at that time. And there were 7th through 12th grade there in, in the one building. And so I graduated from high school there. Jenny, it was student activities or student Yes, I was in a number of the uh, student activities, sure. student government and that sort of thing. Uh, played, played sports and um, I was always the smallest kid on either team, uh, which was, uh, the, the, our, our sports teams back then weren't what they are now at Warren Central, okay? They're, they're state champions with regularity. And, uh, but back then, uh, we, we, we enjoyed it. We, right. we had a lot of fun doing it. Um, and then when I graduated, uh, in fact, um, when I was a senior in high school, um, the principal got a call from a, a company in Indianapolis, PR Mallory Company, which was in electronics manufacturing, and wanted to know if they had a, a student that would like to work part-time after school. And so he, he recommended myself, and I'm not quite sure why, but he did. And, um, and I took that job. And that was really the, kind of the beginning of things because my, my family, there was no one went to college and my father and mother weren't college graduates and uh, so there was really no influence for education and, and which is important I find today. And uh, so uh, I worked there and as a, as a technician. And, uh, While did, you were still in high school? In high school, yes, uh -huh, and worked in, in the afternoons and, uh, and worked in, during the summers. and. Um, began to see um, that the people that had the better jobs <laughs> and the better pay were also the ones that had the education. So it, you know, I connected the dots pretty quick. And um, so what, what I, they, they had a tuition refund program. And uh, as I graduated from high school then, I went to work there full time and started to Purdue at the uh, extension, what they call the Purdue Extension, on, ninth, on the Meridian Street, 9th and Meridian Street in Indianapolis. It was a small building and um, started taking some college level courses. Uh, Catherine, I was terrible. <laughs> I just did not have the preparation for that. Yeah. Um, it's an adjustment. It was, it was a huge adjustment. Right. Uh, coming from a small rural school uh, without any focus on, on education or ever thinking of going to higher education. 
So consequently, I, I went to uh, <clears throat> Tech High School in Indianapolis, which at the time was a very good inner city school, at nights in summer, and took um, algebra and trigonometry, uh, two semesters after trig, uh, uh, chemistry, physics, two semesters each of those, uh, descriptive geometry, and I, I really boned up. Okay. And, uh, and in the meantime, I had changed jobs from, from Mallory's to uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories at Western Electric Company out on the east side of Indianapolis. And uh, in about 1958, I decided maybe I wanted to go to school full time. I had taken the placement tests at Purdue, by the way, before I did all that high school stuff, that makeup, and uh, I was terrible again. I was in the lower, probably lower 25%. And uh, so I, I said, boy, you know, I just really got got to get with it. And in the meantime, I got married, had a child, and I, I really knew I had to get with it. And so consequently, I, I started in school then um, in, uh, at Purdue taking evening classes in about 1958. In Indianapolis? In Indianapolis, uh-huh, yes. And uh, then uh, in 19, I decided that we would, um, if, if things worked out well, I would come to school full time in 59, 1959. And so, <clears throat> Uh, that, that in 1959, I, I quit my job at Bell Telephone Laboratories and uh, was full time in Indianapolis and did very well. Came up here then, and that, it was quite a transition because my wife uh, and I uh, uh, had, of course, bought things. We had washer and dryer and refrigerator. So anyway, we packed all this stuff up in a U-Haul <laughs> and it came and headed up. It headed up to West Lafayette. Yep, 52. 52, exactly. Okay, to West Lafayette. And it moved into married student housing, uh, which in itself was quite an experience. But one thing that I, that I remember vividly when I came up in the spring of 1959, because I started in the fall, or pardon me, 19, in the spring of 60, excuse me. And uh, I came up here, and back then you had to get a histoplasmosis test and, and also a chest x-ray. And uh, you, had, you did this at what they called the infirmary. There, there wasn't a student hospital back then, and, and it was in what they called the executive building, which is now Hovey Hall, in the basement. And so I, I had gotten that, and then I was supposed to go see a counselor, uh, which was in the education building. And so I had the, the, the greeny freshman look, you know, with the campus map in hand, and I didn't know where anything was at, <clears throat> and I saw that the education, there was a railroad. Remember, the railroad used to come across the campus and bring the coal from the south campus over the power plant. And the, the railroad track went from the executive building over in front of this education building. So I said, hey, just walk down the railroad. <laughs> okay. So I walked around the railroad, and I got the map, and I, and I stopped in front of the building, and there was a fellow standing there, a professor-like fellow, and was talking to some others. And he said, um, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for the education building. He said, this is it. And he continued his conversation. He said, well, by the way, who are you looking for? And I said, I'm doc looking for Dr. Will Miller. He, I'm supposed to see him. Uh, for some counseling, and he said, uh, well, he's up, and go in the building here, go up two flights down the stairs, and up, uh, okay, and he said, uh, oh, by the way, he says, I'm, he says, uh, he introduced himself and said, um, I'm George Salen, and he says, uh, I'll just take you up there, and I thought, this is pretty cool, you know, this, this, this is where I want to be, and he took me up there, introduced me, and, and I, it just made you feel Perfect. comfortable, you know, right. that, that this, nice. this was Purdue, that's right. And so, nevertheless, I, I started uh, then full-time in 1960, uh, worked uh, summers. My wife worked uh, also, and uh, we didn't borrow any money. Was there any financial assistance available at that time? Uh, yes, but it was for non-traditional, it wasn't for tr non-traditional type folks. It was okay. for, I was married, Sure. and we had one child, and um, so it wasn't available for us it was for the other the kids okay, okay. and so uh, but so I, I worked and she worked and we didn't borrow any money and didn't didn't uh, go into debt and uh, well the fee system was different then there wasn't yes, a tuition it, oh it was yes fees. there was no tuition no that's correct yeah so and so and, and working uh, she worked during the day I worked during the summers um, in Indianapolis and, uh, and and we put ourselves through but um, uh, then uh, what I what I majored in was industrial education, and um, where were some, your classes held, and what buildings? Would oh, that be? most of them were many of them were in the education building. Of course, okay. we were that was in humanities, social science, and education back then. Okay. And, uh, 
So, and then uh, the labs were in Michael Golden Labs, which is most of it's all gone now. The Kanoi right. building's there now. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, but I went went to, through industrial education. Had some very good teachers. Um, graduated then in four years. Uh, and I, I, people say, well, you know, uh, why did you work so hard? Because I really worked hard. Because failure wasn't an option. Right. There was just too much at stake. I mean, this was. You've I, so gone far I, enough. You wanted to go all the way. Wanted to go all the way, and and I, and I couldn't fail because there was. Like I said we had too much at stake, and and so I, I just studied all the time, and probably in ret it was overkill, uh, and so I, I obviously did quite well. Had a lot of a lot of straight A semesters. Uh, graduated with distinction, but then I, in '63 when I graduated, I. I was going to be a teacher, by the way, because uh, I had uh, a high school teacher uh, that his name was John Porter, and he he was in industrial education, and he kind of took a liking to me, and 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 I thought, well, and I was I did drafting, and I liked drafting. That's what I did at at, at Mallory's and at, at Bell Labs, and of course it was the old style triangle T square stuff, it wasn't the CAD system we have today. So. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, uh, that's what I wanted to teach, and. Um, so uh, I, I started preparing for that, and, and then when I graduated in '63, I had some interviews, and there were some good-looking prospects. And then uh, I was also exploring graduate school, and uh, there was um, um, an opportunity to go to graduate school here. I also had looked at University of Missouri because my Dr. Miller, who was my counselor in undergraduate, he had gone then to University of Missouri and was a department head there. So we went out to Missouri and took a look at that, my wife and I, my, and my little small child at the time, and uh, decided to stay here, and glad I did, um, because uh, at that time, uh, in about 1964, uh, the College of Technology was forming up. And um, Dr. Max Eddy, uh, who was one of my counselors, uh, he, was, he was my uh, major professor on my master's degree, and he had a major project that um, was funded project for several years, and um, and I was his research assistant, and so and I and, uh, just loved the fellow. He was so good to me, and uh, and it built a lot of self confidence. And in fact, what happened was that uh, he became department head uh, for industrial education when the school of technology was formed up, and so he asked if I would finish up that project. And I just I thought overwhelmed, you know, but I was able to do it, and that which was a good another confidence builder, and uh, so um, I, f I finished up my master's, and um, in '64 mm -hmm. started my PhD program. Then, and this opportunity, and 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 finish up the project in in, in about '66, uh, and uh, took a job in the university placement service. I was going to ask you about that. That's and uh, it was a real job. <laughs> was Dick Stewart the head Dick of Dick Stewart was. Dear friends. He and Dorothy, just great friends of ours, and still are. Mm -hmm. uh, they're out in Colorado now. But nevertheless, uh, Dick was the placement director. Uh, Lynn Kaysen was prior to that. He was, he was only going out as I was coming in, and Dick was taking. And, and Dick and I just had a tremendous time with that for several years and while I worked on my, on my PhD. And Dick gave me a lot of leeway to, to do my dissertation. In fact, what I did for my dissertation, um, Catherine, was that uh, when the recruiters would come to Purdue to interview our students, uh, they would usually meet the night before, and they would get a packet of resumes. And, and on that resume form was the student's grade point average. And they would set and prejudge those kids before they ever interviewed them based on that grade point average. And I thought, you know, that is such a disadvantage, not only to the students, but to the employers who are missing a lot of good kids. Sure. And so I thought, there must be a better way of doing this. So I, I, I thought about that and, and tried something, and I thought, I'm just going to do my dissertation on that. And, and so I did. I, what I created was a number of methods by which a student could enter. See, you, if you didn't get accepted at the campus, you went no further. There was no opportunity to go any further in the, in the employment process. And so I figured the further I can get these kids through this process, the more likely I are to get a job. Sure. And so I tried different methods and, and, and tested those methods. And in fact, when I got ready to run my analysis, and we, 
the computer was very crude back then. There wasn't any laptops and all that. And I couldn't find a computer program that could analyze my data. Ended up getting a, a program from Sandia Corporation in New Mexico and, and to, to do my analysis. But make a long story short, that what I, what I eventually did, I created a form <clears throat> which allowed the student to display their grades by semester. And, and many students at Purdue Codo, they change a degree, okay? And, and so if you say you start out in engineering and you're in there a year or so and you didn't do very well and, you, and your grades were low, it takes you a long way to time to climb out of that. And so this allowed them to plot these on a, on a graph type arrangement and, and then also provide an explanation. As noted, you can see on my fourth semester, I transfer it out and, and then, then watch my grade point average, see? And, and the kids went further with that and, and that form, by the way, was used by the, council, the, by the placement uh, agency, which oversaw all the association that oversaw all college placement, and they adopted that. I have no idea if, how long it was in use, sure. but they did adopt it and, it, and it did help our kids immensely. Now, during this time, I, I should point out that um, the College of Technology was forming up, and uh, Dr. Ho who was also in industrial education, became the head of industrial supervision, which is now organizational leadership, which I'm presently in. And, uh, and I was helping him try to f get his students placed. And, uh, and While you were still in the placement office. That was in the placement office. And uh, at the same time, uh, George McNelly, the, dean of the, of the first dean of the College of Technology, was also trying to find people to staff the college. And so I was helping both of them and, and, and developed a, a good relationship. Well, a, f a faculty position opened up in, in what was called industrial supervision at that time. And um, Dr. Hull asked if I would interview for that, and I did, and, and lo and behold, I got it. I was the first PhD f f uh, and first 10 month faculty member in, right. in, our, in the department. Let me ask you, did that, t uh, was it formerly known as industrial education and became supervision or yeah. were there separate departments? Th that's oh. a good question, Catherine, and, and a lot of folks didn't see that. We, we were, as I said, in the college, uh, in the uh, School of Humanities, Social Science, and it was mm -hmm. industrial education. And there was a general industrial major in industrial education, which prepared people to go into, the, in, into industry as a, as a first line supervisor. Then there was the, vo the at the um, educational side of it, which was vocational education and industrial arts. And so there were two sides of that. Ed, Dr. Eddie was head of the, oversaw the, uh, uh, the vocational industrial arts part, and Tom Hall, Dr. Hall, saw, oversaw the, the, the supervision side of sure. it. And so, that, and that, so that, that's where those two came from. And uh, so then I, I joined the, the faculty and- um, oh, Supervision. And, and supervision. And it was a first, first 12 month uh, PhD and uh, we did everything back then. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, you talk about counseling. some things that you did: counseling oh, yeah. and coordinator. Oh, yeah. yes. See, because that's the way it was back then. You did everything. You know, and and, I, and we were in South Campus courts, and those they're still there. They, you know, but they they were student residents, and, and so the closets were still there. You know, and the mirrors and stay just like it was a room. And uh, but, so I get a little tickled today, you know, with all the new stuff. And in fact, reminiscent that education building we were in, we had two we had two room two big rooms, and everybody was all the staff was in those two big rooms, the faculty, and and there was a there was a brick wall in between about that thick, and there was a hole in it about like this with a platform on it, which the telephone set there, and both so, both rooms used that telephone. <laughs> I okay, love so, it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, but yes, we, we, we did everything and, and uh, did a lot of counseling. You also uh, were the, uh, the coordinator for grad study. Graduate, graduate study. We okay. started a graduate program. At that time, we were under the umbrella of uh, the humanities school. And, and so... But oh, we it's still started, not a separate school at that time. No, we were not. Uh, no, we, we, were, we were a separate school in terms of the School of Technology, but we were not separate on our graduate program because we did not have an adequate... PhD faculty, you see, at that time starting up to sure, do that. So yeah. we, we were under that umbrella for quite a period of time. Okay. And uh, so, yes, I had a lot of graduate students, good students that went on and became faculty members at other universities. Uh, started the co-op program. Back at that time, uh, the, uh, co the official co-op program, the only approved one was in the College of Engineering. And uh, so I prepared a proposal 
to present to the university administration to approve the School of Technology to have a co-op program. So we got that started. We started uh, also um, uh, internships. Uh, what, what then was ex work experience, we called it. And it was it turns out now it's internships. But uh, some innovative kinds of things. And, uh, and, and I enjoyed that immensely. And uh, then uh, I, I started um, doing some consulting. In fact, my, I got a call in the early 70s from Anaconda Wire and Cable Company in Marion, Indiana. And uh, they wanted to know if I could come over and, and do some, some tr management training, management supervisory training, and some cons related consulting things. And so I went over, and it worked out quite well. And, and that began to flourish. And uh, as I began to do that sort of thing in other companies around the country, what I noticed was that there was a, a what struck me as counterproductive kinds of activities going on. People weren't weren't were loafing. People were deliberately sabotaging some things. And I thought, this is you know, this is interesting. Uh, so I, I, I took an interest in that and started um, doing some research on it. And uh, and and uh, I, I was asked by a friend in, in Indianapolis I'd gone to high school with. He was a uh, HR manager, human resource manager at Citizens Gas Company in Indianapolis. He was also active officer in the uh, Indianapolis Personnel Association. So he asked me to come down and make a presentation. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll talk to them about this counterproductive behavior, because that's a good human relations talk, you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> to, to, uh, I, I hope you don't bleep me out on this, but I called it the nobody gives a damn syndrome, okay? and. Uh, and that really, and John List from the Annapolis Star was there. He wrote an article on that. And, and of course, it went across the wire services. And Bob Topping, you probably know Bob. God bless him, I love him. He, he, he took an interest in this as well. And he started writing a series of articles, a number of articles, and releasing those out on this topic. And, uh, and it, it just, it, it just took, took root. And, uh, it took off. Huh? It took off. And, uh, uh, in fact, the, the University News Service are, are arranged for me to be on the Today Show, so I had a nice interview on there, and, and I was on a number of major television programs and, and, and the like, and, and the articles in the newspapers, uh, and I did about 500 presentations on this. So I thought, well, you know, what, what I was looking, I noticed it was, a, it was affecting productivity and quality. And our quality was really deteriorating at that time. And, and it's, it's, it's affecting us right now because we lost a lot of our industry offshore, as you are aware. Yeah, right. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm gonna, I, I, first of all, I, I tried to make sure it was there and, and see the magnitude of it. And, and then I, th I thought, well, now, well, what's causing this? And, and as I began to study it, and I had some, uh, some private company and, uh, money that funded me to do some research on this, and, and I found that it was it was a, a systemic problem. It, it was it wasn't just the individual's lack of initiative and and, and being honorary to do these things. It, there was there was other kinds of things in the system which was which was affecting it. And, and so uh, as I began to to work on that and and, and get into more into systems kinds of issues, uh, that linked me up to Dr. W. Edwards, Dr. W. Edwards Deming. And Dr. Deming was a, is a world renowned. Well, he's no longer living, but he was a world renowned sure. systems person. And uh, so um, I helped form up uh, the Indianapolis Quality Council. It was on the founding board there. And and Dr. Deming would come because he was working with a, a division of General Motors in Indianapolis. And so we worked with him when he would come there. He would spend some time with us. And uh, and to this day, I'm still active with that institute. But um, uh, I, what I started doing was developing a, a system to try to ch transform management, tra transform organizations to address these issues. And so I developed this, this system, work improvement system, which I, I teach to this day, and uh, put it, began to put it in place at companies all, all around the country. And there's dozens and dozens and dozens of them. And, 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 and it works if you work at it. And, um, and so th that's, that's where that came from, and that's where the consulting came from. And then the day we are, of course, uh, active with the Deming Institute. Uh, Dr. Deming was a was a marvelous person. He was a revolutionary and a visionary. And uh, it, it just in reading his book, when I, I have my students read his writings, okay, it's like reading the difference between the New Testament and 
the or rather the uh, revised version and and the in the in the old te the right. original version of the Bible. You know, it's a you got to read his stuff. To, uh, and he uses old language and so on, but he he really makes the point. And uh, so what has happened though over the years is that. Um, the, they have an international conference, and they always had it in Washington, D.C. And over the years, uh, as you sat around and, and looked to see who was there, it was always the same people, <laughs> and they were getting older. <laughs> and so how do, you, how do you perpetuate this? And uh, they said, well, I, maybe we need to get some young people. I said, that's a good idea, you know, let's get young people involved. And, uh, well, we can't get them to Washington. No, you're going to have to go where they're at. <laughs> so we convinced them. In fact, I had one of my students make a prepare a presentation to come to Purdue University for the first time. And this was in 2005. And uh, this young lady did a marvelous job, presented to the board, and they accepted this. And it's been a, a remarkable success ever since. We, okay. we developed a... Um, kind of a format for other universities to use. Uh, this past year was the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And, and so we, every other year it comes here and, and then other, other times it's someplace else. And so we have a large number of, of students uh, that attend. And um, it sounds, it's really caught on. Oh, it really has. And, and, and then those that can, af another thing w which we developed, one of our good partners, uh, Jack Hillary at uh, he owns the, uh, his grandfather started Louisville Slugger Placeball Back Company down Louisville. And, and he's one of our supporters. And he gives us $30,000 <coughs> and for these kids to go to, uh, annually to go to these to this conference. And uh, so that's that's helped a lot, yeah. too. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's been... It's really grown. Oh, it yeah. really has. How has the department? The department has grown, enrollment has grown over time, too? Yes, it has. And uh, you've been involved over the years with curriculum, was one, and especially in the early days. Yeah, it, it evolved. It, we, we, were, we, were, we were the only, other than industrial education, the only BS program in, in, the, in the school, I keep wanting to say college because it's changed now to the College of Technology, yeah. but it was the only four-year program other than, industrial other than industrial education. And so, in the, in the other technologies like um, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and, and aviation and so on, Th those people took two years of that, it was because theirs were only two-year programs, and then they came into our program and finished off the last two years and got a BS degree. And then those, those programs evolved into four-year programs, and so they, they're on their own now. And our enrollment has, in fact, what we've had to do actually is manage the, we, we, have, we don't cap, we manage, okay? so we, we manage the enrollment. And keep it. It's about it was six. It's about running about 650, and uh, of course, the university right now is in uh, in a focus on research and and more on graduate education and, and a little less focus on the undergraduate. So our enrollment is now going to be around 500 steady at about that as, right. as we see it now. What about outside support? Do you have industry support too? Yes, we your, do. We, and we, your, we your placement is probably pretty good. Yes, for this. we have. We've had we've had surprisingly a very good placement. Um, the, um, the, the another thing about our, about our undergraduate program, it's it's versatile, in that you can go into a first level management position, or you can go into technical sales, or you can go into uh, human resources. You can go into training. There's a number of different kinds of avenues that the students can can take. But along those lines, Margaret, is the uh, Catherine is is the fact that um, when I was in undergraduate school here. There was one girl in our in our class, in our four-year group that went through. There was one girl in that class, and now over half the students are girls, and so the focus, you know, a lot of our early on was going into in the heavy industry. They went into manufacturing jobs. Mm -hmm. and of course, a lot of the girls didn't want to go into heavy industry, right. and so that changed. Plus the fact that we shifted more toward a service industry, and that opened up a lot more opportunities for them. But um, but, but that's been interesting to watch as well. Yeah, I would I would imagine. Yeah. And your graduate program has grown. You have more. And yes. your faculty has increased. Yes. Too. In fact, what what we're doing as as we speak is hiring more people with PhDs to do more research, uh, and to increase our graduate enrollment. Right. Our our objective is uh, we we're running a probably about forty graduate students, is to go to a hundred, in the next several years. Yeah. And and so. You know, everything changes. I mean, I've just seen so many changes. The physical changes of this campus, of the of the student population, of the faculty, the administration, they change. And you've got to. I mean, you've right. got to change. That's right, exactly. Uh, 
How about your research? Are you still continuing in the same area? Still, still in, yes, I sure, okay. yes, indeed. And uh -huh. your consulting yep. continues, yeah, too. It still continues. And uh, uh, I, I, I started um, the, the consulting, and, and it, it just a absolutely outgrew me. And so I farmed a lot of it out to people that are in our, in our, on our faculty. And, uh, and then I started doing, I also began to franchise. <laughs> and we had franchises all over, over this place, all over the country. And, but that just got to be so much work. And uh, so as those contracts uh, came up for renewal, I, I just phased them out and we <laughs> didn't do that. But, uh, and, and so travel, I did a huge amount of travel. And uh, I don't like to travel anymore. <laughs> not that way. I, vacation maybe, but not, not it's travel a lot. for work. Yeah. It's a lot it, different. It really is a lot right. different. And yeah. so consequently, uh, I've, I've, I'm serving on some boards. I've served on three uh, boards. Um, and uh, I probably will do more of that as I get younger. Right. <laughs> right. Um, now, let's talk about some of your awards and honors. You've got the, um, gotten the Murphy Award and a lot of teaching awards. Y yes, I, I, I've always appreciated those awards. Uh, the, of course, the, the, what makes them special, they're from the students. And uh, I enjoy teaching. I, I, I love the kids. And as I and tell them. And you've done a lot of it. Yes, a lot of students. And, I, and, I, and I'm teaching grandkids now of these kids that I had before. Okay. And uh, <laughs> so it's, um, uh, I've, I've always enjoyed teaching. In fact, I tell the students that I've, uh, uh, if I, I'd have gone full time consulting uh, if it hadn't been for the kids. Uh, that I get much more satisfaction out of building leaders than rehabilitating them, right. and and, I, and I really do. Uh, in fact, on one of those teaching awards, the, the Great Book of Teachers, I was uh, put in that inaugural book, and that was that was a real. Uh, I was a humbling experience. I, I didn't anticipate it, and there was just an awful lot of good people in there. You know, they went back 130 years. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of good folks in there. Right. I, was, I was amongst a pretty good company. <laughs> One of the nice things I like about that too, as well, it's not alphabetical or anything yes. like that. It's it's random, and it's and uh, I I think Ringo probably has something to do. I think it's a nice way to to list it. Yes, it and is. It's yeah, much it, much need there's, there's, more appropriate. There's, and every five years they add to that um, new new group. And uh, so that, that that's it's that's really, a real really treat. nice. Are you still active in some of the associations that you Yes, I, I uh, of course, the, most of my focus is with, with the Deming Institute because sure. we're, we're, that planning is ongoing. And, and we, we have international conference calls once a month to plan on our planning. And uh, so a lot of my focus is, is with them. But I, I belong to the S uh, Society of Manufacturing Engineers and the You're Association. You're on that quality, the Association for Quality. The Association for Quality. Right. Uh, Association for Manufacturing Excellence. Uh, still, I still have a keen interest in manufacturing, and and I, I really am concerned about the amount that we've lost in this country because we've got we've got to be able to right. provide jobs yeah. and and make things for ourselves, even even though it may not be to the extent that it has in the past. Right. But so I still focus. I teach. I started a class called Lean Enterprise, and I taught Lean back years ago before it was ever known as Lean. Sure. <laughs> and. Uh, but uh, I, uh, the students enjoy that. The students uh, if do very well who, who focus, who, who learn well in the courses. They, they do well out on the job, and then the employer said, where did you learn that? Can we get other students who know that? That's, so that, that's, that's very been, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's been a very good endorsement. Right. Very Let's talk a little about family. Uh, you have uh, children? Yes, I have uh, a daughter and a son. Um, my, my daughter, um, Bob, my son, Bob, attended Purdue, but he didn't finish. And uh, my daughter Debbie did, uh, and Debbie graduated from Purdue and uh, did graduate work at Texas A&M, and, um, and and they're both married now and, and have children. And um, do they live? Do they live? Yes, they right? all live. Uh, Debbie, of course, was away at, 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 in College Station, Texas, uh, while she was there at A&M, at, at but uh, they're all back here now. And uh, my son is self-employed in the landscaping business. And, and uh, lawn work, and then um, my daughter Debbie is presently uh, her, she's got a seven-year-old in the first grade, and so she's uh, kind of her career is kind of on hold right now while she gets the, this daughter through school, which I admire for that. Right. Um, but she she works in the, in the mayor's office. She's on the mayor's staff in West Lafayette. Oh, West Lafayette. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she majored in Homeland Security, uh -huh. and uh, and that's what she get her graduate work yeah. in too. That's, so that's good. And that, 
family's what are, here. What are your current activities? Still teaching and then consulting? Is that teaching and consulting, and then uh, the the I'm also on the homeowners association board and uh, locally. Lo local? Yes, uh -huh, uh -huh. Westport edition, and um, and then my, my wife and I have a lot of hobbies and interests. We we love antiques. We we have a home on Lake Freeman as well as in West Lafayette, so we've got it antiques and she. She is a bear, uh, a bear collector, teddy bear collector, and uh, and I collect lighthouses, and we like to go see lighthouses and old <laughs> barns and and all the neat things and like all that. the neat kinds, you know, that, that, and those kinds of things, and that that takes this, a. Takes a lot of time. That's right. That's yeah, right. And yeah. as a collection builds, you have to be more selective because you've got oh. lots of stuff. And, and the, we're, we're now thinking, yeah, what are we going to do with all this stuff? <laughs> okay. oh. Now we'll talk about your tradition. And well, you tradition. Can, yeah. You okay. Could show. It'll yeah. Get okay. The uh, tradition back when I was in school, uh, when you were a freshman, you always looked up to the seniors because they the seniors wore yellow cords, and and they were the only ones allowed to wear yellow, yellow cords, and so you. When you were a senior, you got to paint them all up nice and, and put uh, things on them. In fact, you can tell how I'm dated here with this old Purdue seal on here. Okay. It's a nice seal. Yes, it is. Uh, my my uh, uh, For the land grant. Land grant seal. And um, uh, my sister-in-law, uh, Norma, painted all this up for me. I'm not a good artist. And, uh, of course, back then, the uh, uh, <laughs> Purdue Pete and, uh, and such on the back here. Uh, but uh, that was that was a trick. I don't think they do it anymore, do they? I haven't I don't seen kids so. do that anymore. I don't believe uh, but so. it, it was a big it was a big e event. But the, the the tradition which is is sustained itself that I enjoy is the Christmas tree uh, in, in Memorial Union Building. Uh, that that's always it's a really nice. Take the carrying kids there and let them see this and take photographs and it's 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 really special. Really, yeah. How about an outstanding event? Anyone else you'd like to share with us? Um, of course, married and raising family and all that sort of thing is an outstanding event. Graduating from Purdue University, I'll be honest with you, um, it's been a privilege and an honor to be part of the Purdue com community. Mm -hmm. um, one I, as a as a youth, I'd never ever dreamed of, and I would never wouldn't have happened, frankly, had things not taken okay. place as they did, and and my. My wife's family was a huge influence. They were Purdue people. They were Purdue graduates, and uh, her brothers and sisters went to Purdue. Uh, one went to Earlham, but some, the others went here. And and I and I and that began to take root. And they were always very supportive of and encouraging. And uh, so graduating from Purdue University was was a was a huge right. event right. for me. Yeah. And continues to be. <laughs> That's right. I'll leave it to you. Any closing comments or some things that you'd like to, the topics that you'd like to return to? Anything special? Well, I, I you know, mentioning Purdue community. Uh, there, yeah. It's there's just a lot of marvelous people here, yeah. um, and and the advice that I've received from from these people over the years, I could never remember it all. But um, Dean Potter, <laughs> so you remember Dean Potter, <laughs> but he was quite a fellow and um, he was retired but he came to came to his office daily for years after he retired and just a marvelous fellow and he knew my father-in-law when he was in school here and he knew back then he knew people by name and and um, when I was in the placement service he was still he was still doing consulting work and combustion engineering was was one of his clients and he invited me to go to lunch with him and some management from combustion engineering. And while we were seated there, he and I were waiting on the others to arrive. And he, I was about to finish up my PhD, and he, he asked me if what I was going to do. And I said, well, you know, uh, I've been thinking it over, and I'm looking at some different options. And, and, and he said, well, Jim, he says, I, I know you'll make the right choice, but he says, don't be a peddler. In other words, use your talents and your abilities to their maximum to be helpful to others and make things better. And, and I always thought that was just nice, very, nice comment. very good comment, you know. And and the, I just got a lot of those kinds of things. And Dr. Eddie, like I said, was uh, just like a second father to me. Uh, of course, none of these people are still living. And but they it, make an impact. Oh, and they long, did. It lasts. It lasts forever. Uh, we were we were had a, this project and it was in Evansville that I told you about and uh, it was a demonstration project and trying to create a, an educational program for the at-risk kids. These were high school designated to be high school dropouts, 
And uh, this was a four-year project, and, and it was immensely successful, I might add. But when, when we first went down there, I was, a, I was a graduate student, and we met the school administration, and, and he introduced me as his colleague, you know, and I thought, that's, that's pretty special, you know? And, and so things like that uh, that stick with you, and, uh, and so make it more encha enchanting and enjoying. Absolutely, down the road. absolutely. And, you know, and then what happens is you try to do that then right. with the the kids that, you know that I've worked with right. over the years. And it works. And it works. Right. And it sure yeah. does. Right. But it's I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity for to be here to interview with you well. and uh, to share these these thoughts with you. Uh, but again, it's it's been a privilege and an honor to to be a part of Purdue right. University. Thank you. We want to thank you very much, Dr. Wendell. Thank this you. Concludes it. <clears throat>